Good morning to you all. It's a great honor for me to be speaking to you today. I so wish that I could be there with you to celebrate the flutes of the 19th century. I've been looking forward to this event for a number of years now, especially to meet in person so many of you who I know electronically. I'm sure this will be a very exciting couple of days for the 19th century flute. For so long, these instruments have been mostly ignored by historical and modern flutists. One can visit them easily at museums, but unfortunately, seldom is their sound heard. When I was a young flutist, I thought there were two kinds of flutes, Baroque flutes or modern flutes. If I looked at a flute piece and it clearly wasn't meant for Baroque flute, to me, it was a modern flute piece. For many of us as performers, those first couple of times being asked to play a Beethoven symphony on original instruments started the process of trying to understand and get our fingers around the new techniques and range that we hadn't previously played on Baroque or classical flutes. All that time in the third octave and playing third octave A's for days Luckily, the keyed Grenzer models had come to the attention of players. Before too long, we were seeing copies of Koch and Liebe flutes, providing a more varied tonal palette, and sometimes a great third octave. Many historical flutists were dragged into needing to learn the romantic flute in some incarnation. Organologists and collectors had a head start on us players in many cases but the instruments seldom had a voice. This wonderful event in Basel shows us that it's time for people to take the 19th century flutes seriously with all their vast differences and complexities. I wanted to say a few words about the conception of this event. In 2016, I was invited to attend and speak at a conference in Portugal put on by Ana Music, the Portuguese Musical Instruments Society. I gave a very general talk on flute history in a concert employing various antique flutes from my collection. At the close of the conference, I was asked what I thought about the idea of having a flute focus at the next conference, and did I think there would be people interested in it? It sounded like a good idea to me, <clears throat> and I went to work setting up a flute-centric program which consumed about a third of the conference. We had a small but outstanding group of flute people, including a number speaking here. Jorg Fiedler, Rick Wilson, Boaz Bernie, Francesco Carreras, and the late Uli Halder, as well as Johanna Marsden, Jan de Vinne, and Portuguese flutists Sofia Cosme and Olavo Barros. Did all the people at this conference enjoy the flute focus? I would have to say no, maybe half of them did. What I did learn is that historical flute enthusiasts had a great time being together. Having the opportunity for people from around the world to spend time together talking about old flutes and music was a fantastic thing. Following the conference in Portugal, I traveled to Basel with Jörg Fiedler, and as we were walking around this beautiful city, I started forming the idea for a conference entirely devoted to 19th century flutes, as they seem to be much neglected. Jorg agreed immediately and we started brainstorming about who we would love to have attend. As we had just come from the event in Portugal, we were quickly able to develop many excellent ideas about such an event. We then had a wonderful lunch meeting with the late Uli Halder, who was also very excited about this idea. Where could we hold this event? Maybe a conservatory like Oberlin, my conservatory in the US, maybe Brussels, but we very quickly thought the Scola would be the best place in the world to hold this event. I'm so grateful to the Scola, Martin Kirnbauer and Mark Huntai, for accepting this idea and moving ahead with it 
after a number of COVID bumps in the road. Between the time we planned this event and now, I completely forgot the specific topic of my talk, although the idea remained the same. I had been thinking mostly of the adoption of the Böhm flute and how the changes made by the French makers allowed the flute to appeal to flutists much better than Böhm's original ideas. I have widened my remarks a bit. As a collector, I started off collecting any flute that seemed interesting, but rather quickly homed in on French flutes as my favorites, both for collecting and for playing. I realized that as a fan of French instruments, my view of the successes of the French is probably somewhat prejudiced. And I realize that there are a number of people in this room today who could give the same talk from the German, English, or Italian point of view. After feeling a bit shy about that, I realized that much of the knowledge we gain is through people specializing and then sharing the special knowledge we gain. I hope that over the next two days, this event helps us all in broadening our knowledge and interest in the 19th century flute. As a player and collector of historical flutes, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the differences and contrasts between one flute and the next, one city and the next, one decade and the next, one country and the next. I have found aspects of the French flute designed to be especially appealing. Aspects such as the reasonably small embouchure, small tone holes, simplicity of key work, and sweetness of tone all help to give the French flutes their beauty, if somewhat delicate, sound. The developments to French flutes over time strike me as very conservative and yet very effective. The desire to have a sweet, pure sound seems especially important. Clearly a choice was made between trying to make the flute louder and retaining its refined qualities. While in other countries, England, for example, volume became very important. The concept of enlarging tone holes to make the flute louder was seldom practiced in France, with the result that the flutes retained the ability to use cross fingerings and often quite good tuning. This conservative approach was also due to the fact that developments were strongly influenced by a small number of the most important flutists in France. For instance, Devien, while admitting that the four key flute had merit, he stuck with the one key flute as did his followers until he passed in 1803. In the following generation, when Toulouse was the top man, he held back the adoption of the Böhm flute at the Paris Conservatory until he passed away in 1865. This approach helped the quality of simple system flute building as they had time to really perfect a design while aiming for the qualities desired by the Paris Conservatory professors. I think it is evident that once the top makers like Goffroy and Bellesson had created a superb five or six key design, others emulated their work, particularly in Paris. Professional key makers supplying the same or similar designs to different makers also helped standardize the available flutes. Another example of French conservatism is the fact that they continued well into the 19th century to consider the flute a D instrument, while fine flutes in England were invariably C foot instruments and in Vienna, B foot. From my experience in French flutes, at least, the D foot almost always works somewhat better than the longer. As the French composers went along with the expectation that D was the lowest note of the flute, a C foot was mostly required for flutists wanting to play German, English, or Italian flute music. The Böhm flute was probably responsible for getting the French composers to include C or rarely low B in their flute music, which then carried over to the simple system flutes. As is the case in every country, flute models consisted of a wide range from cheap instruments, probably used in bands and playing tunes, to very high quality instruments used by professional flutists, 
and very expensive and fancy instruments owned by the rich and often used as presentation pieces. At the extreme end, we have flutes like the crystal flutes of Claude Laurent, which are generally something a musician could not afford unless given to them as a gift. While the French makers were not as involved in experimental designs as makers from other countries, that doesn't mean they were shy on innovation. The surface key mounts, thought to have been invented by Laurent, were very important and can be found in many interesting forms. The abascule key system was interesting and includes some of the ideas present in the pewter plug. Another important innovation was the Tulu F sharp to allow the equal tempered F sharp rather than the normally low tuning on simple system flutes. This development is a good example of musical taste, the fashion of high leading tones, or at least equal temperament, driving innovation from the flutist makers. While Tulu is credited with designing this key, it became quite popular and was included in many of the more substantial French simple system flutes, especially the 10 key designs later in the century. These photos are all flutes from my collection. In the later 18th century, the wooden mounts are typical of what we see elsewhere in Europe and usually found with a standard rectangular flap. We find some examples of a very simple rectangular plate on which is mounted the key. The example here is from Denis Buffet. There is also a very early Goffoy, not in my own collection, which has the exact same mounting. The oval shape became popular and is found on flutes of Tortoiseau, De Luce, Jovet, Holzapfel, and others in the second half of the 18th century into the beginning of the 19th. Here are examples of what we call the saddle mount. The diamond and shield mounts are a wonderful example of the artistic design that works very well mechanically. This iconic design became quite popular and we see it on flutes from many makers. By this time, Keys were often made by professional key makers rather than the flute makers, so we often see the same keys on flutes from various makers. The French system of silver hallmarks makes it possible to identify many of these key makers. Eventually, these fancy and costly mounts were replaced by the simple post mounts. As we know, Boehm introduced his new conical flute in 1832 and traveled extensively throughout Europe trying to interest players and makers in his new design. While people were often very impressed by the flute and by Boehm's own playing of it, he had very limited success in getting players or makers to adopt the new flute. What I find particularly surprising is the fact that conservative France turns out to be the country where the new flute makes a strong foothold that eventually led to its somewhat universal appeal by the 1930s or 40s. We will see that it is exactly this conservatism that helped the new flute to succeed. Sometimes the acquisition of a flute leads one down an interesting path of discovery. Such was the case with this flute, important in some ways to the development of the boom flute in France. A number of years ago, I received an email from a gentleman in England who had an old flute to sell. At that time, I was becoming seriously interested in the conical boom flute and owned a fairly early Goffa. <clears throat> the email contained a number of photos, this being the best. What I saw was a beautiful conical boom flute, which was clearly not a Goffa, but quite early. I had no idea who made it, but I knew I wanted to buy it and explore from there. I made a deal with the seller who was not involved in flutes. He told me that he got the flute as part of a trade involving a bicycle, a camera, and a guitar. As I waited for the flute to arrive, I looked carefully at the photos and confirmed it had a Doru G-sharp 
no B-flat thumb key, no vaulted clutches as we would see on the early Guafa flutes, a foot joint different from anything I had seen previously, mysterious trill keys and a strangely shaped embouchure, and rods and axles where I wasn't used to seeing them. It was also clear to me that this was a really fancy instrument with specially shaped keys and an unusual embouchure hole. I really had no idea how significant a design this was, but it was a beautiful flute. I was able to see that it was marked Buffet Jeune, but I was still mystified by its design. I sent photos to a number of my colleagues who were experts in French flutes. Gary Lewis, a flute maker and restorer in California, fairly quickly came up with the fact that this was a flute made by Buffet Jeune in collaboration with Victor Koch. Thus began my interest in Koch and his fascinating and somewhat scandalous story involving the earliest years of the Boehm flute in France. In the year leading up to the 1837 manufacture of the Conoco Boehm flute in France, several younger French professional flutists were persuaded by the new flute. These included Louis Doru, Victor Koch, and Paul Camus. To varying degrees, these flutists realized the potential both musical and financial, of the new flute. They all desired to represent Bohm's interest in France and were well-known performers and teachers. Of these three, the most aggressive was a Victor Koch, who was willing to go to any lengths to be the main figure representing the Bohm flute in France. I find his story to be quite amazing, and it must have been quite alarming to his competitors. Victor Koch, 1806 to 1881, was known as a virtuoso flutist, but probably not in the top tier of players. He was a student of Jean-Louis Toulou at the Paris Conservatoire and received a first prize in 1831 and was subsequently appointed as Toulou's assistant. In some ways, Koch would go on to become one of Toulou's worst detractors. Tafanel says of Koch, the bombastic Koch, who always described himself as the only one to have introduced the new system flute in France. Koch must have made contact with Böhm around the same time as the other two flutists and wrote Böhm an adoring letter in 1836 before any of his flutes had been released publicly in France. He went on to publish two documents about the new flute, including his critical examination of the ordinary flute compared with the Böhm flutes from 1839, which discussed the advantages of the new flute over the old flute. In 1839, he published his lengthy treatise and Camus and Doru did likewise. Prior to this, Koch had written to Böhm requesting that he become Böhm's representative in France and that Böhm should come to France, start his own shop, and legally prevent Goffat or others from producing Böhm flutes. Böhm did not go for this. I suspect he already knew that Koch was trouble he informed Koch that Camus was to be his agent. This caused Koch to need a new plan. He decided to try and discredit Böhm by creating, or at least spurring on, the controversy with Captain Gordon. The title of Koch's treatise tells it all. The new flute invented by Gordon, modified by Böhm, and perfected by Koch. If we read the various 19th century sources about the history of the flute, we find this argument as an important issue, especially prominent in the books of Rockstro and Welsh. In both of these books, Koch is clearly intertwined in an attempt to lower the esteem of Böhm in an attempt to set himself up as the perfecter of the new flute. As Koch wanted to be the kingpin of the new flute, and since he was not going to get cooperation from Böhm, he decided to design an improved flute himself and have it built by Bouffier Jeune, a top quality wind instrument maker. 
Part of Koch's scheme was to have the bone flute added to the curriculum of the conservatoire and that he naturally would be appointed professor. He would then hold great sway over the flute and to the adopting of teaching and for that matter of what flute was bought and what method would be used in the teaching. Part of the process of getting the bone flute established in France was to gain the acceptance of the Academy of Science. In 1837, Boehm and Camus first approached the Academy about approving the new flute. The Academy showed a clear interest in the Boehm flute, and in 1838, the commission from the Academy began work in earnest with Camus presenting to them. There were various changes made to the formulation of the commission, including the addition of six musicians, including Carabini, the director of the Paris Conservatoire. Koch then prepared a pamphlet basically to help the examiners with their work and discussing the various improvements he himself had made to the flute. The object of all this was to get the commission to think of the flute of Koch and Bouffet as the true new and improved flute, replacing the flute of Boehm. When the commission began working again in March of 1838, they included the improvements introduced into the manufacture of the flute called the flute of the Boehm system by Mr. Koch and the method or school, as we shall call it, that gentleman had written for facilitating the study of the new instrument. This resulted in the Koch Buffet model officially being approved by the Academy. His next step was to get the Conservatoire to approve the new flute and hire him as professor. This started a fascinating process where the Conservatoire held what amounted to a competition between the old and new flutes to determine if the new flute should be added to the curriculum. Mr. Koch and friends in one corner and Mr. Tulu and friends in the other. This was an event worthy of its own conference presentation. A panel of judges was convened, headed by Carabini. Koch had challenged that there was music that simply could not be played adequately on the old flute, but was playable on the new flute. The two sides challenged each other with repertoire that they thought the other side could not play. What we gather from the results is that both sides were able to do excellent performances of all of the music. Unfortunately for Mr. Koch and the Boehm flute, the committee, after three days of meeting discussions and demonstrations, failed to approve the teaching of the new flute and, of course, didn't hire Koch as professor. We can easily imagine that Tulu was a very powerful person and professor and that his word held great power. And by the time, it must have been fairly clear to everyone that Koch was a scoundrel. Tulu said, a proper flute must be sweet, tender, expressive, and passionate, and similar in expression to the human voice. He also pointed out that the three people presenting the Boehm flute to the committee were each playing on different versions of the flute, presumably Camus on one of Boehm's own flutes, Doru on a Goffa, and Koch on the Buffet Jeune. Also included were two more flutists who had tried but rejected the Boehm flute. The committee did not like the fact that the embouchure design of the three flutes was not the same, as well as aspects of the keys and fingering. It is also worth noting that Tulu was around this time presenting the idea for his new flute perfectionne, which borrowed some features from the Boehm flute, such as rods and axles, and added new trill key options. Following all of this dissension, Tulu saw to it that Koch's students, presumably playing on the new flute, all failed and Koch was dismissed from his position at the Conservatoire. The choice of flute was very serious business during this time. Despite the new flute not being taught at the Conservatoire, it continued to move forward with its acceptance in the flute world. 
The early gold standard was clearly the flute of Gofoy. Two very interesting aspects of his design were the Gofoy retained the typical French design for a fairly small oval-shaped embouchure hole. This was done to keep the sweet sound the French prized and make its tonal qualities reflect the best qualities of earlier flutes. Thus, a flutist who made a beautiful sound on one of Goffa's simple system flutes could reliably make a fine sound on the new flute with a minimum of adjustment. The other extremely important change was the addition of the closed G sharp invented by Doru, returning to the old fashioned idea that pressing the keys should yield a G sharp rather than a G natural. This made the adoption of the flute much easier for flutists raised using simple system fingerings. Note that in the case of Koch's flute, he used the larger square embouchure hole shape of Bohm as well as Bohm's indented lip plate. Koch did have the idea for the closed G sharp prior to the introduction of the Doru G sharp and had experimented with key design that worked like the simple system flute. He seems to have quickly abandoned that and gone with the Doru G sharp. We know quite a bit about the Bohm flutes of Goffa as we have many extant examples. This flute was a successful commercial product and this 1832 or ring key flute continued to be made in various forms by many makers all the way into the 20th century. It is very important to understand that the introduction in 1847 by Bohm of the cylindrical model did not mean the end of the conical Bohm system. Many people preferred the sound and playing qualities of these flutes, and they continued to be used extensively in France as well as in Germany. The Bohm design, as adopted by Goffa, had a feature we call a vaulted clutch where the little arm over the key was used to close that key. This type of clutch was later replaced by a more modern design, which we may know as the buffet clutch, which you will see being used probably for the first time in a flute by Buffet and Koch. As there were, in fact, many new things introduced in this flute, Buffet applied for a patent in 1838, which was granted in 1839 thus no more than a year behind the introduction of the flute of Goffa. The patent application is extant, but missing the drawing of the flute, which interestingly can be found filed with the patent of Bohm's 1847 flute, presumably misfiled at some point. It is clear that both Goffa and buffet must have made, if not marketed, a Bohm model flute in 1837. Why is it that we hear and see lots of information about the flutes of Goffa and virtually nothing about buffet Koch flute? I think the main reason for this lack of attention is that no examples of this flute had been known until now, and they were clearly produced for a very short time. Once Koch was rejected as professor by the Conservatoire, his plans of creating a flute to be adopted by the Conservatoire were dashed, and Buffet probably wanted to continue his work on the clarinet rather than deal with the difficult Mr. Koch. Despite the unfortunate dealings of Koch, this flute did have many innovative things and is not to be dismissed. The clutches based on buffet becoming standard very quickly. I'm struck by the sustained interest in all types of flute up through the end of the 19th century. One might assume that since the metal bone flute made such a big impact in France that other types of flutes would fall away in use. Or at least, as happened elsewhere, the simple system flutes would become cheap flutes and were not considered by professional players. Looking, for instance, at the 1880s, we still find high quality simple system flutes being made in addition to the metal and wooden cylindrical flutes, and most surprisingly, a strong continuing interest in the conical boom. 
In this slide, we can see a 10 key simple system flute, a B foot conical boom, both made in the same period by Buffet Crampon. The cylindrical flutes are represented by a wooden B foot flute by Lefebvre and a silver flute from the Villette shop of Louis Lowe. Those flutes are all finely made instruments, all in use at the same time in France late in the 19th century. As we will hear in the talk by Rick Wilson, the flute industries throughout Europe were busy creating flutes to compete with the Bohm flute. These are sometimes called hybrid flutes, which combine elements of the Bohm flute with the fingering system of the simple system flute. The French were not as involved in this as, for instance, in England. One particular type of flute, which I believe originated in France, maybe with the Soudre company, are the metal cylindrical simple system flutes. These were quite popular and were in use well into the 20th century as cheap alternatives to the metal boom flute. Here are two examples, one fairly simple and the other with a B foot, Tulu F sharp and high trills. These flutes were also extremely popular in Italy. For me, the most significant French response to the boom flute was the flute perfectionné of Toulou and Nonon. My first experience with a flute perfectionné was an instrument by Thibauville that I purchased, but with which I was not impressed. Luckily, in the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to play flute perfectionné instruments by Toulou, Nonon, and even Goffa, which are instruments made to the highest possible standards, and they evolve not only innovative keywork, but superb embouchure and bore design. In the case of a maker like Thibauville, and I assume the many other makers who produce Toulou system flutes in France and Italy, they were just attaching the basic keywork of a flute perfectionné to their own normal flute. I doubt the flute perfectionné had much impact on the sales of the boom flute, but they did give us a wonderful example of superb flute making. I have a B-foot Nounon with a special ring key mechanism, which further raises the leading tone F sharp. In terms of French flute ideals, the flute perfectionné continues to have small holes, very similar embouchure to what other fine French simple system flutes would have, which means it continues to have quite usable cross fingerings. In fact, there's something in the design of Mindonon that actually improves the cross fingering of F natural. The importance of Devian and his followers allowed the one key flute to remain a superb instrument well into the beginning of the 19th century. While there were a number of makers interested in developing new and interesting keys, the trend of duplicating keys for both left and right hands was avoided until the very end of the 19th century. It is my thought that the conservatism of the French makers allows the changes which made the French more willing to learn the new aspects of the Bohm flute. The French continued to make all types of flute well into the 20th century and didn't let the quality of their simple system flutes fall as they did in many other countries. The French were conservative in their flute making, but I have seldom met one I didn't like. Thank you.